and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man was risen from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to God. Please be seated. So I think on Sundays like uh, today, when we have a major event in the life of the community, um, it's important to just address that and uh, talk a little bit about that. And I think it is always a good opportunity to consider who we have been in the past, who we are presently, and, and imagine together what we might be in the future. Um, so that's kind of the gist of what I'll do. I'm going to use the Transfiguration uh, text as sort of the way to, to get there. Um, I'll also be referencing a talk I did this week. Um, I was invited to be a speaker at uh, Minister's Week at Texas uh, Christian University. Um, I didn't wear my Longhorn shirt. Uh, <laughs> uh, my talk was uh, pastor of the parish, uh, chaplain to the culture, and kind of details the ministry I do uh, Monday through uh, Saturday outside these four walls. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and a, and a new piece that's just happened that I'm very, very excited about. Anyway. So that's the task. Uh, let's take a moment for silent prayer that God might speak to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the servers down at the Flying Saucer, her name is Tori, uh, had a section that nobody was sitting in. Uh, and I went and sat there, and nobody sat there almost the whole time we were there, so she was able to come and sit and talk. Just an incredible young woman. She's 23 years old. Um, over Christmas, she was diagnosed with diabetes, and she has to give herself insulin. She has a tattoo, of course she does, uh, that, says, that says, I'm unsinkable. And then she said she had another tattoo on her side uh, that says, fearfully and wonderfully made, which comes from Psalm 139. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And so as we're talking, I said, well, Tori, um, with diabetes, uh, uh, how do you understand that to impact your fearfully and wonderfully made? Did that change the way you think about that? She said, oh, no. I think this diabetes is a gift. It makes me more aware of my body and my lifestyle. And I've planned now to go back to school and become a dietitian so I can help other people who have diabetes. I had just started a practice, this new thing, with another uh, person downtown where I send a text message with just a simple Bible verse and then a one-line kind of theme for the day. And I said to Tori, would you like to receive that? So the very next day she got Ephesians 2.10. We are God's masterpiece, created to do good things. And then I write, do a good thing today, you masterpiece. I saw her the next day, she said, I love that, it was a great verse, it was perfect for me. And by the way, I told my boyfriend that from now on, he's got to call me a masterpiece. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Uh, now, I don't think Tori's been in church for a long, long time. Um, she might come to pub church, she said, but that's not the point. What happened because of that one conversation and this idea I had about sending out Bible verses to wait staff and to bartenders and to baristas, I went from one person two weeks ago, I now have 21 people on that list. I'll just be hanging out and talking and someone over here said I'm doing this and they go, Pastor Phil, I'd like to get that too. It's the way in which uh, we come down off the mountain and go out into the fields and highways and byways, come down into the valley and do the work of God. I think that this community from the very beginning had that as part of their DNA when that first pastor coined the phrase, we are the friendly church serving Christ and community. So we kind of do both things. When we think about those folks so long ago that uh, came out here to uh, uh, this, uh, it was like a wilderness territory, wasn't it, Richland Hills, not in 56. Uh, only one road between Fort Worth and Dallas. 
And those Norwegians and a couple Swedes decided we needed a Lutheran church here in Richland Hills. I remember one of them, might, you might remember as well, Florence Culp, and then her name was Florence Means, whose husband was the first president. She described the way in which they put the sanctuary together, the pastor going before them, putting glue down, and all the members, like on their hands and knees, laying tile down on the floor. And that's what she remembered about creating this space that has become something so much more. I love it when we sing, uh, shine like the sun. We consider those who now shine in that place of perfection. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, I can see their faces. I hear their voices. I remember where they sat. Some of you are sitting, by the way, in their seats. <laughs> <laughs> I remember their faithfulness. I remember that they, uh, all they wanted to do was serve Jesus uh, and be the kind of people that make a difference, both within these four walls and more importantly, out there. This Mount of Transfiguration is often talked in such a way that we think that Peter is saying he wants to stay on the mountain by making these dwelling places. That's not what it means at all. In fact, whenever Jews had an experience of God, a terrifying vision, a theophany is what it's called, they would always put a marker down. What Peter's saying is, we've got to mark this place because this is where God came down and walked on the earth. This is where we saw the one who we love transfigured into that form that he possessed from the beginning of time. Let's put something down. It was an out-of-body experience, if you will. I think that's, that's what this place is when we come here. Maybe it happens to you when we sing, I don't know, beautiful Savior. Maybe it happens when... You see someone that you uh, value in your life, and you're able to minister to them in this place. Maybe it happens when you come and kneel at the rail and receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and you know that no matter what, everything's going to be all right. Maybe it's a word spoken, a word read. I don't know how it happens to you, but I think that's what happens in this place, a theophany, a God-shining moment where suddenly you are more encouraged to then go out those doors and do the work of Christ. Now, God's heart through human hands, but it's exactly the same as the friendly church serving Christ and community. I think when I first came here, um, I was reflecting to this in my talk at TCU. Um, I didn't have any classes on evangelism. Uh, the idea was not that I was going to do anything other than take care of you people, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was going to preach, I was going to teach, I was going to do the communion, I'd come visit in the hospital, those kinds of things. But no thought at all that my every day would be spent telling other people about Jesus Christ. Um, that has changed for me so dramatically. And I'll tell you what changed it probably more than anything else uh, is this instrument which now you people can reach me wherever I am. <laughs> so I don't have to sit in my office all the time. And that has changed my life more than anything else in my entire ministry. And I think it's changed you as well. I had someone ask me at the talk when the time for Q&A, say, how do you get your congregation to be okay with you not being in your office? And I said, I think I just tell them the stories about what happens to me when I'm outside my office. And then that happens to you, too. I remember Mary Reichenbach right here who called me on the phone. She was at a, a car wash talking to a young person. And she wanted to know, what's that church we're doing in the bar? Because I think this person might go to it. Doing the exact same thing. And I know you all have stories like that. So when we consider now um, our present, we see that we are engaged in life-changing, world-changing things, from chicken ministry that raises money to build wells in Africa, um, homeless men coming and becoming our friends, so we get to know them, and when we see them on the street, we know that they're our brothers. It's doing quilts and crocheting and sending things all around the world to make a difference. It's teddy bears on Mother's Day to go to children who are abused, all those things are ways in which we impact the world. We are a different congregation because we do those sorts of things. And when we consider the future, and we consider what this space might look like for that generation that will follow us, a larger gathering area so that we can interact with one another, so that we can get to know each other, perhaps, so we can have a moment for a cup of coffee and an encouraging word, a major instrument, perhaps, on this wall an organ that makes a statement. It's a 100-year it's a instrument. That's what it is. 
It's an instrument that will be here long after we are all dead and gone on to glory, praise God. And when a person sees that, they'll say that makes a statement about this congregation, these people of faith. They're committed to the traditions of the past, the ancient hymns and liturgies, and yet they use technology in innovative ways. It's both and. It's inviting, perhaps, our musicians down to be one with us, to sit with us, to interact with us, so that we all together might worship. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't really matter whether we vote to do it or not. The most important thing is the way that we get there. So I want you all to come to this meeting, whether you're for it, against it, or whether you just don't care, <laughs> whether you've not even been engaged in the process. I want you to come, because I think we have an opportunity this afternoon in the Family Life Center to do something well, and that is disagree. Now, you might be a visitor here and you're not going to be able to vote. You might be a first-time visitor here. This is what I want to say to you. I would like you to come to that meeting and watch us. And if we can do that well, then you might consider that we are worthy to have you come and join our community. If we can't do that well, then, then leave. Get away from us as fast as you can. <laughs> and to us sitting here, if we can't do that well, doesn't matter what we vote. We should close those doors and lock them and walk away. It's all about how we live together. Do we care for one another? So that perhaps next week, when uh, you're sitting next to the person who voted the opposite way, you say, it doesn't matter, because I love you, not a building. <laughs> I love you, not an organ. I love you. That's the important thing so that we can go out and do that other work where baristas and bartenders and service industry people receive a word every morning that says, God loves you. That's what we're about in this place. I don't know what the future will be. I mean, I am already thinking in my mind about how many years I have left and what I want to do after that. So I'd like you to imagine today when you go and vote in that uh, Family Life Center that you're voting for something that will be here when you are not. And, and ask yourself the question, would that be a good gift to give the next generation or not? And then vote your conscience, <laughs> but do it well and love each other without fail because that, my friends, is what changes the world the power of love. So, to that God who calls us to be the friendly church serving Christ and community so that we might express God's heart through human hands, be our glory, honor, and praise now and always. Amen. <laughs>